We've missed you. Pour yourself a drink, pop some popcorn, throw those wings in the oven, grab any snack. It is time to catch up over pre-show cocktails, or tea, or water, or whatever. Before the curtain rises at our favorite place, the Stratford Festival. Let's gab about the shows of the 2021 season, the plays, and the cabarets. This, this is show starters with Alexis and Ijoma. Cheers. Cheers. Hello and welcome to Show Starters. My name is Ijoma Imesuam. I am a woman in my 30s, mid 30s. I have brown skin and um, darkish brown curly ringlet hair that's kind of at the top of my head in a high ponytail. And I am wearing a bright blue shirt. I come to you from Stratford, Ontario, Canada. This is the ancestral land of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat and the Neutrals. And this land is governed by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and Treaty 29. I am joined today by Director Ravi Jane and Assistant Director Christine Horn. Ravi, Christine, uh, will you please introduce yourselves and tell us where you are virtually joining us from? Sure, hi, so I'm uh, Ravi Jane, uh, pronouns he, him. I have a uh, short black hair, freshly cut uh, with the new uh, opening. It looks like I have more hair than I actually do. Um, I have blue glasses on and a black sweater. And both Christine and I are calling in from Takaranto, which is the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Uh, I'm Christine Horn. I have uh, long blonde hair. I'm wearing glasses. Um, I'm wearing a bright green shirt. And I am more in my late 30s than my mid 30s. <laughs> Visually debatable. <laughs> <laughs> I never go outside. <laughs> Thank you so much. Assistant Director and Co-Adapter of R&J, Christine, is a Dora Award and Canadian Screen Award winner. In 2016, Christine was awarded the Burke's Diamond Tribute to Women in Film. She told me when I asked her what she is proud of in her career is that she surrounds herself in good artistic company. And I can tell that her drive to create, explore and collaborate is exemplified through her impressive theatre career, which spans from classics to new play development. Christine also serves as a member of Shakespeare and Ruff's incoming collective artistic leadership. When everything stopped in 2020, Christine was one day from beginning rehearsals with Theatre Smith Gilmore's production of Ovid's Metamorphosis. This season marks Christine's debut at the Stratford Festival as part of the Langham Directors Workshop. Also is Ravi. Ravi is a multi-award winning director who prides himself, as he says, on embracing the terror in his work and exploring the creative unknown and finding something new in all stories he explores. He is the co-artistic director and founder of Why Not Theatre. Ravi is a Canada Council John Hirsch Prize and Pauline McGibbon Award winner and in 2016 and 2019, he was shortlisted for the prestigious Simonovich Prize, a production of Seasick, which he co-directed at National Theatre in London, and his adaption of the Indian epic Mahabharata, set to premiere at the Shaw Festival, were both put on hold when the pandemic hit. He is a 2010 participant of the Langham Directors Workshop, and Ravi returns for his second season as a director and co-adapter of RNJ. Welcome, Ravi and Christine. Do you thank have you so much? Drinks. I feel like we should read your bio. <laughs> just, to, just to have you sit and listen to it. It's it's kind of the worst thing ever. <laughs> no, or the best because it's a celebration of your accomplishments and how incredible you are as human beings. So true. Cheers well, that, I drink to that and cheers glasses. to you equally. Cheers. cheers. Great. So now. I ask you at home to open your imaginations and picture that we are not appearing before you from our individual computers, but rather that the three of us are gathered in my backyard, uh, sitting at a, uh, a little patio set that I have. And it's so beautiful right now. The greenery is in bloom and it's there are purple flowers and hydrangeas in bloom and it smells beautiful. And we are quenching our thirst with refreshing gin and tonics. 
maybe from Junction 56 Gin here in Stratford, Ontario, but most definitely as Ravi has offered with <laughs> golden nugget infused ice cubes. Because if we can fantasize, why not add gold <laughs> infused ice cubes? <laughs> amazing, amazing. I love it. Many of you watching <laughs> might be familiar with the famous story of the star-crossed lovers, Romeo and Juliet. But this season brings us an incredibly reimagined adaption by Ravi Jane, Christine Horde, and Alex Vollmer, which is intended for blind, low vision, and sighted audiences alike. So please grab a libation of your choosing and join us for some pre-show drinks as we discuss this season's production of R&J. Cheers to everyone at home. All right, let's get into it. I would love to start by just asking you what inspired you to reimagine R&J? Why this play? Why now? Um, yeah, so it was actually a, a kind of a long conversation with Anthony and I. And um, uh, at the time, it was pre-pandemic. And it was, uh, yeah, it was like February, just before everything hit. And at the time, you know, the thing I latched onto was, you know, two young people in a world of adults. And, um, you know, uh, if, if we could just let young people live they wanna live, maybe they could show us a new way. Maybe they could just be free from the old um, rivalries and um, inheritance, inherent, inheritance of rage um, and sort of bad habits. Um, uh, and maybe they would find a new way and maybe their love could, could reinvent a new future. Um, and so, you know, uh, that's how I really feel about what's happening in the world right now you know, we are stuck in pretty old patterns of behavior. And, you know, I feel there's a real generational tension um, uh, in the world uh, for young people to lead. And will they be actually able to lead in the way they want? Um, you know, we're really feeling that with the changing of language, like this whole introduction that we've done of acknowledging land, uh, identity, uh, access needs, you know, all this language change has really been a part of a generational shift. A lot of the the previous generation, uh, this this whole concept is foreign to them. Mm -hmm. So we're we're in it. We're in a change, a moment of change. And and for me, this play really, um, really kind of gets at that with these two star-crossed lovers and in, in a world of uh, of this kind of hate. The other the other aspect of that was really interesting to me was the, the idea of identity and just who you are. Um, you know, she says, uh, uh, Romeo, Romeo. You know, forget your name Romeo, a rose by any other name would smell sweet. It's not about the name. Um, and so identity was something, you know, that's kind of a through line in a lot of Shakespeare's plays. And in particular, I started thinking about, well, so much of how we relate to identity now and, and with the, as I mentioned, identity politics and all these things that are changing, so much of it is visual. When I see you, I'm getting a lot of information as to who you are, who I assume you are, and then the historical narratives based on your skin color, your gender, your abilities, your uh, whatever. And um, so playing with casting was a very, it's something I, I like to do already. Christine and I worked on a production of Hamlet, which she played Hamlet, um, which uh, sadly is a, a new concept, you know, hasn't really been done a lot in Canada. Um, and so working with Alex Ballmer, who's a blind artist, uh, playing with that identity or that, that idea of, well, what if you, what is identity when you take away um, sight and when you take away um, the reliance that we have on, on that uh, way of, um, let's say, judging people or understanding who people are. Yeah. So those were two, my two guiding things, sort of generational and identity and really kind of playing with that um, was, the, was the real starting point. That's great. Um, so this production is a um, a production in collaboration with um, a company, your company, Why Not Theatre. Could you talk a little bit about how this production came to be with Stratford and and what you hope to gain from this collaboration and a little bit about Why Not Theatre? Yeah, so Why Not Theatre is a company I founded uh, in 2007. Uh, and uh, it's an international company based in Toronto. Uh, we've grown from so, me in 2007 to a full-time team of 11 people now, which is really exciting. Uh, it's been a pretty amazing growth. Uh, that's rare for a lot of independent companies in Canada. Um, and we, we basically, you know, um, we do three things. We make 
uh, we make, share, and we provoke. So we make and tour original work that challenges the status quo of what stories are told and who gets to tell them. The second thing is share. We share our resources with other artists to support them to tour their work and make their work. And uh, right now we have a real focus on not only BIPOC artists, but mid-career artists and trying to help um, independent artists get to that next level in their career. How do you grow as an artist? And now that we've grown this company, we want to support more people to grow. And the third thing we do is we provoke systems change to remove uh, barriers of access for artists and audiences. So that's anything from innovative producing models to help emerging artists make money from their art to right now we're working with the city of Toronto to look at accessing underutilized spaces in the city to turn them into temporary rehearsal halls. And to, so basically turn office spaces and, and stores, storefronts into free rehearsal spaces for artists to use because so much of an artist's resource go into subsidizing their work through space. It's one of the most expensive problems that the city has, and we often ask the poorest people to solve it. So can we come up with an innovative way to look at um, just a new way to look at it, a new way to think about solving this problem? Um, so yeah, so that's what we do. And, and this collaboration happened because, you know, Anthony uh, approached me about the changing conversation, as I mentioned earlier. And, you know, why not? We, we spent a lot of time thinking about care. Uh, and process. We're a process-based company and the work that we do, I mean, I think is so unique uh, because of the way we make it, which really takes care, allows everybody in the room to be themselves and creates the support so that those people can be them, their full selves. Um, and so part of coming to the festival in this moment of change was to say, okay, well, how do we, um, how do we take an old structure and an old institution and bring new ideas? And what is the way to protect me to do that, to, to protect the artists to do that, and to help the festival maybe work in ways that they're not used to working and, uh, and be guided uh, through that process by a sure hand, a generous hand, and, and a, a company that is used to collaborating with big institutions. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a really, it's been a, a, tons of learning and really um, a really um, exciting new territory for Stratford who doesn't usually partner with theater companies um, like us, but we have managed to do that with the Shaw Festival, with the National Arts Center um, and companies abroad as well. So um, yeah, it's been great so far. And, and, and again, it's about bringing new ideas, new ways of working, new ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so me and my team, we get to do that. That's wonderful, thank you. Yeah. So this production, as you've kind of hinted at a little bit is is a reimagining of Shakespeare. And we all know that the Bard's words are highly revered. Um, so I'd love to just talk a little bit about the adaption of this production. Um, it was adapted by both of you, as well as Alex Bulmer, who's appearing as the role of the friar. Uh, Christine, maybe you could talk a little bit about the process of developing this script and how you came to be part of it, um, et cetera. Sure. Um, Ravi, w once this was already underway, he already had cast Eponine Lee as Juliet and he already had Alex Blomer playing the friar and had started cutting, um, working on this adaptation that had to be short <laughs> for the, the, the season that they're doing. And first just sort of asked me to take a look at it because um, we had worked on Hamlet together. And so we already have a working relationship working I, with- I call Christine, adapting, Christine, uh, I fondly call Christine a nerd because she loves Shakespeare and she's a nerd. And so if ever I'm gonna go to a text, I want to talk to a good nerd. <laughs> I love Shakespeare, but I also love cutting it. <laughs> like I love, and I love the, the sort of irreverence of it. The, the, I love it, but also I love the, um, I love kind of not loving it, uh, challenging it and changing it and all of that. So, uh, so I was like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I would love to do that. Um, and, uh, and so we went into this, uh, into this workshop with one kind of script and then through this, through this workshop, um, and maybe Ravi's probably a better person to, to talk about, but to talk about this, but through that workshop really had to change what we thought hmm. we were making um, to really center the story around Alex as an actor and therefore the friar as a character. Um, and so this whole adaptation really sprung out of how to center the story, I suppose, and make a new story out of 
out of this thing. So we really like tracked our whole first <laughs> adaptation. Yeah, it was great because, yeah, yeah, because, because so, you know, Alex is a, a blind artist um, who has worked a ton in England and, you know, is an accomplished voice teacher, but hasn't done any classical, let alone Shakespeare. And so I invited her to be part of the project. And, you know, in the workshop, the assumption I, I made was because of, as Christine mentioned, we have to be, you know, six, 70 or 80 minutes long. We have to be socially distanced. We can't touch. I had a, originally imagined, I was like, okay, it'll be an empty space. It'll be this beautiful thing with a carpet. Mm -hmm. It'll be, we'll use mime. It'll be gorgeous. And words will bring to life everything we see. And, oh, it'll be perfect. And the very first day with Alex in the space, in this empty space, she's walking around and she's like, so I have no idea where I am. And I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, well, I understand space through my relationship to other objects in the space. And I touch things and I need to touch things so that I know how to orient myself. And right away I was like, oh crap, that's, we ha that's impossible now the, where we are with this idea, we have to start over. And then in, in, in just in that thought, in, this, in the idea of starting over, we, we redesigned the script to center around the friar as, as the storyteller. So if we're all going to be able to work together at, in the same way, we need to create equity um, in terms of, like think about moving in the space. We all need to move in the same space, in the space the same way. We need to find a way that one person isn't at a loss or looks awkward or at, in any kind of, you know, for anyone. So um, very quickly, Christine and I, uh, we, we kind of reimagined what the story could be from the friar's perspective, centering it around her character, which opened up again, a, a ton of possibilities because the friar is, it's his idea to get these two married. It's actually Romeo's, but then, you know, he, he, he goes through with it and comes yeah. up with really zany ideas to try to save them and just leads to their unfortunate death. Um, so, so it really opened up uh, an exciting uh, kind of, uh, place to play from. And it was working also having Julie, Julie Fox, our designer around too, because we thought if it's the, if it's a space that Alex is going to be super comfortable in, then it's the friar's home. And so what is the friar's home? And what is the story that would take place in the friar's home? Because Alex also said that it it's, would be easier for her if she doesn't have to get on and off stage. So we we're like, okay, so the friar is on stage <laughs> all the time. And so what is the story that comes out of, out of this situation that it's the friar in his home all the time, um, which was a really exciting place for this thing to kind of launch out of, which was not at all what we thought, you know, the day before. When we spoke before, um, Christine spoke a little bit about um, what inspired her about this new new perspective. And I think um, what is gained uh, from the depths of these characters that might not be allowed um, or might not be as um, noticeable or, or um, available um, without having that focus. So what did you kind of realize in this refocusing on, on the friar and what does that bring to the story? Oh yeah, Alex has this amazing, and I hope that everybody watching and listening to this right now has a chance to uh, hear Alex uh, to speak too, but this great um, kind of image that she shared with us is that is if you imagine a sighted person, out in a park by a pond and that sighted person sees somebody pick up a stone and they throw it into the pond and they see the stone go and it makes a splash. And that's kind of the end of the journey. And she said a blind person at the same pond is gonna hear a sound and that's the beginning of the story for them. Um, and so it's it's been interesting in terms of, I, it's another thing that sort of has come up in this adaptation is that sound is initiating a lot of things. Sound is triggering I'm not sure if we've said this actually, but that our RNJ is sort of set after the play and it's the friar remembering the story. So a lot of things that are triggering these memories are, um, are sounds. And I think it's also an interesting way to think about adapting these plays. And the normal thing <laughs> is that you see the person launch Romeo and Juliet and you know exactly what's gonna happen. <laughs> and, and what we're kind of trying to do is start from the splash. And then what is the what are the possibilities that that come out of that. So yeah, just from, this is a play that tells you um, the end at the beginning. And so you, often you'll see the show and then you know, as Christine said, you know what it looks like. It looks exactly the same like the productions you've seen before. And for us, from that sound of that first prologue, 
how do we rediscover and reimagine how we get to that end? Yeah. And through the friar, you know, what's so exciting is this is a character who, you know, he, I think he has the third most lines in the play, but, um, you know, what became so clear in terms of the story for us is he's the one who's racked with guilt. He has this monologue at the very end that goes, you know, oh man, he's dead, she's dead. This is what happened. It's all my fault. If I messed up, you know, send me to jail. And they're like, no, no, you're an old friar. It's okay. And, and you know, imagine, we sort of imagined him living with this guilt of what if, what if, what only what if this happened or what if that happened or what if I didn't give her a poison to pretend to die? You know, what kind of a plan is that? What um, if I didn't leave when, you know, after she woke up at the yeah. end, what if I stayed? You know, and that, that, you know, that, that grief, that, um, that lack of closure and, and, you know, how, how do we deal with that? How do we, how could, would someone like that um, function and, and thrive? And part of the inspiration also was, I remember in the workshop, Tom Rooney mentioned in, in our original cut that Christine and I had, we chopped the ending severely. And Tom mentioned, you know, at the very end, something that he loves, because he played Romeo, you know, I'm sure he played it a million times. Um, he mentioned that at the end, the Capulets and the Montagues, they raise statues to Romeo and Juliet. And that for him, it was important that like memorializing those two is, is, is why we tell this story is to remember, you know, these, these mistakes that older generations make and, and kind of repeating this story. And so Christine and I really kind of mulled that around a lot about what is the memorial of this? How, what, what, telling the story is the memorial of this. Telling the story is, is the memory. Um, and so through this lens is, is the friar five years after it happens, he, he, every year he goes and visits their memorial and puts two flowers down for the two lovers. Um, but as he does that, he can't help but relive memories. And, and as he, as he um, imagines them, they come to life in his space around him. And some of them are happy and some of them are traumatic and some of them loop and you can't get them out of your head. Um, yeah. And so that, that's, that's the kind of experience we're looking to, to get at in order to look at this play. I'm wondering, uh, for those that are watching this, um, that might be seeing Shakespeare as their first piece of theater, like this production as their first uh, experience with Shakespeare uh, or experiencing this piece. Um, I'd love to know what Shakespeare play first sparked you or inspired you and what you hope this production will spark in the audiences that experience your production. So I can remember definitely certainly like reading plays in in high school reading you know Shakespeare once a year but I think when I was near the end of my time in high school in my drama class I did well I recently reread Richard III and I read this scene and I cannot believe that me and a couple other 17 year old girls did this scene the scene with all the women the all the 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 duchess and the and Elizabeth and all and it's like a really long scene <laughs> where they talk about Richard and and that was I think one of the first it was the first time that I worked on Shakespeare as an actor and I'm sure there's lots of stuff that I didn't under that I didn't understand, but also I really kind of understood the power of of that language, and uh, I think that would be it for me doing this like scene that I was like really inappropriate for <laughs> from Richard the Third when I was like but experiencing 17. the power of the language, yeah, totally, yeah, totally, and it was speaking it right. There's like reading it in school. And then there's actually sort of speaking it that is a different, I think a different thing. And what do you hope um, this production might spark? I think people get nervous. So this is actually maybe not about Shakespeare, but I think people get nervous when you, the, about something that says, oh, if it's um, that, how do I want to articulate this? I hope for example, it would make people want to seek out maybe more work that Alex is doing or you know that it it's like it kind of is a gateway to maybe some of the other artists to some of the artists in the show um that they might that maybe audi audiences coming to Stratford might not normally have access to okay so the Shakespeare play so the first play I performed in was Hamlet um it was the first quarter of Hamlet and I played Horatio I fell in love with that character and I thought there was so much more to that character than people gave credit to 
And so when I created an adaptation of Hamlet, Horatio was ki kind of the lead. Uh, and it ended up being uh, a deaf actor named Don Jenny Burley who played Horatio in the Hamlet that Christine played Hamlet in. Um, and you know what I loved about it is kind of what you were saying about when you shift the focus and the lens, you know, there's so many characters in these plays. And when you see it from a, a story has multiple stories within it. And depending on the lens you look at it, you can really learn something new about it. And when we uncover these individual, these surprising characters, we can feel differently. Um, and then for me to go beyond that, when we cast differently, when we see and hear uh, different actors in those roles, we, we actually see and hear those, the words in a different way. And I think to me, in terms of inspiring, what I hope it inspires is, is curiosity in, in what's possible. Um, the theater, you know, I often say, especially with classics, and I find this a lot in Canada, that people approach the text like a map that, that has a straight line already drawn on it. I'm going to go from here to there. The thing about a map is you can go many different ways. You can take detours. If you have traffic, ways will tell you a different way to go. <laughs> that was unexpected. And so, so how do we embrace that idea of these maps, but that there are so many different journeys in that um, cartography, in, in, in the drawing, uh, and not look to just A to B. And for me, a big part of that is, is, is discovering different ways of, of stories within we just need more of, we need to understand um, that there are, are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy. I mean, it's something we love to say, but it's, it's impossible to let go of the thing you know. Um, and that to me, I think with this in particular, I really hope that it just makes you go, wow, that's not what, a, that's not what the book said. And to go, oh, we can do that. Theater is, is, is going through a uh... And metamorphosis, I think, or it has it has a a um, an opportunity to go through a metamorphosis. So, what are you encouraged by, excited by? What um, what are you hopeful for as we move into this? So many different reckonings mm -hmm. happening, be it a racial reckoning, ra racial reckoning, um, understanding colonialism, uh, understanding uh, gender inequities, understanding. Uh, 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 sexual uh, inequities, you know, there's so many inequities, class, money, um, so many things are happening right now that have been fought for, for many, 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 many years. Mm -hmm. And so many people before us have been fighting this fight. Um, and I would say, why not in particular, we were born, I was born out of the fact this company, I started really because no one would hire me. I had this amazing international resume. And when I came to Canada, Nobody knew who I was because everything was international and everybody told me I should start a South Asian theater company. And I was like, why? I'm, I'm whiter than you. You know, I don't speak Hindi. I don't, what are you talking about? I so and relate ultimately, to I, I'm the, <laughs> I know. And I was like, but I'm the avant-garde. You know, I don't, I don't relate to that history. I don't even know that history. My teachers were the avant-garde. You know, I worked with Ann Bogart and Mary Overly. I, the pioneers of, of kind of, um, you know, a contemporary thinking in, in theater. And so the we're in a moment that's really strange for someone like me because, and, and for I, I imagine definitely for the older generation, because things are sort of changing in, in that we're able to have this conversation and we're able to say these things out loud. The thing is, is will it really change? And, you know, I was saying to someone today, for me, I, I'm busy. <laughs> I just had a child. I don't need to do this. I'm doing this because there is an opportunity to potentially make change. Mm -hmm. The story can make change and the impact it has for those who experience it. And the process can make change at, at this place that is looking to try to make change, um, that has a history of not changing. Um, and so there is an opportunity. It's just so tricky this moment as to, um, what it will be. And that's exciting and very scary. And, and for me, it was a big reason why I wanted to do the show at Stratford with Why Not in conjunction, because that is potential again, potential for a change in a new kind of conversation. I don't know where this is going, 
uh, all I can really control is this conversation, the people in the room and, and the kind of story we're going to tell, which is exciting. And we're all, that's joy, you know, um, but there's so many factors that want to um, um, take from that joy. Yeah. There's a lot of work that's still being done every day, every day. Today, I dealt with three fires, yeah. you know, it's not over. Um, the joy is, is the people and uh, the opportunity is um, to, to really speak truth to power and, and to, to be fearless in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that is all mm -hmm. the time we have today. Thank you so much. I would love to just know um, what we are. I'd like to make a toast and I, I invite you, Ravi and Christine, what are we cheersing to? To the unknown. To the unknown. I love it. Cheers. Unknown. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Show Starters. Please check out Stratfest at home and look at the other episodes hosted by Alexis Gordon on the cabarets in this Stratford festival season. Until we meet again, virtually or in person, be well. R&J Show Starter, hosted by Ijoma Imaswam, with co-adapter and director Ravi Jain, co-adapter and assistant director Christine Horn, in association with ACTRA Toronto. Production support is generously provided by Dr. M. Lee Myers and by Catherine and David Wilkies.